um, with Constitutional Rights Foundation. And with me is Gregorio. Hi, I'm Gregorio Medina, and I'm a Senior Program Director with Constitutional Rights Foundation. And David. And my name is Damon Huss, and I'm Senior Editor and Curriculum Specialist here at Constitutional Rights Foundation. All right, next Welcome. slide, we'll go over the agenda for the day for this uh, PD session. So um, our agenda today is civic engagement. You know, what does the latest research say? So Damon will be sharing a little bit about uh, what is effective civic um, engagement and the research behind that. We'll also overview the California, California State Seal of Civic Engagement. Um, also really curious about what you are currently doing and what your um, districts might be doing um, to get your students eligible to get that seal in their diplomas. We'll introduce Civic Action Project as a way to earn that civic seal and kind of go over next steps, kind of what CRF can provide you, you know, providing professional development for your um, for your school, your district, your your social studies department, or what what have you. So that's the agenda for the day. All right, and for I don't know, can I just see a show of hands of how many are familiar with Constitutional Rights Foundation? All right, I see a lot of hands up. Scott Petrie, I hope your hands up. I just saw that you came in. Um, yeah, for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, we've been around now, actually since 55 years, we're close to 60 now. We're a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization, and that nonpartisan piece, super, super important to us. Um, that's what why teachers from around the country trust us um, in the classroom because we're not trying to push a specific position. You know, we're there to provide multiple um, sides with specific topic and let young people come up with their own decisions. So um, we run programs as well as material and uh, public published materials uh, nationally. Some of our big programs are mock trials, civic action project. We do an expanding horizons internship program. And then nationally, uh, in addition to civic action project, another big publication we do is uh, our bill of rights in action. Actually, we we'll can um, put that in the chat later. I'm gonna follow up with the document with all of these resources. So you can have them in one document, but if you don't get our bill of rights in action, please sign up to get it. It's a great resource, um, always provides, um, it goes out to about 30,000 teachers across the nation, always has a US history, world history, um, government or current event in it. There's a background reading as well as discussion questions and interactive activity. So uh, we'll, like I said, I'll provide information on that. And there's also a whole history of them on our website. So it's all free, ready for teachers to use. All right, well, moving on. Next slide, please. So I just wanna ask a question. You can feel free to unmute yourself or put in the chat. Well, actually let's just do the chat right now. Has your school or district developed local criteria for earning the California seal of civic engagement? We're just curious what's going out on out there at your particular school or in your district. And I don't see any, okay, no, we haven't. Okay, no worries. Thanks, Pete, for participating. Love it. Miss Morrow, not sure, no worries. Great, Scott, yep. LHD has a committee working on that. Yes, they do, they do. I think we have a couple of committee members here, including our very own Damon Huss. Great, great. Um, you're navigating the process. One of the schools is leading the way for us. It's great, wonderful. So it looks like we have a variety of people. Some people who have already, schools have already started it. Some aren't sure yet. Um, and some are pretty close to being done. So regardless of where you are, we're gonna provide you with resources that you can use to have your students earn that seal that meet those criteria. So you're in the right spot today. And then Greg Garo just posted in there an example of Irvine USD and how they uh, did their criteria for their state seal. If you're curious at looking at that. So next slide. I'm gonna turn it over to Damon Huss to talk a little bit more about um, the research behind what is effective civic education. Right. Thank you, Laura. Uh, and some of the, you see the word up here is inquiry. So a lot of the research-based uh, resources that you see listed on your screen and that we're gonna be talking about today with regard to Civic Action Project and the California State Seal are, uh, centered on an inquiry approach to learning civics and social studies. 
And the three resources you see listed here, two of them are national resources and one of them is a state resource, resource here in California. Uh, and I encourage you to investigate all three of these if you're not familiar with uh, all of them or any of them. Uh, the first one at the top you see is Educating for American Democracy in this project. Uh, the EAD is uh, a national project and there are many resources for teaching history and for teaching civics. It is based on in, an inquiry approach and also uh, it was developed by you know, a consortium of scholars and specialists in education in order to get students looking at fundamental questions and there's lots of questions on this uh, website for the ed for educating for American democracy and we'll be sharing those links in the chat area with you so that you can bookmark those and actually go back and take a look at the resources that I'm showing you. So there's lots of questions uh, that can guide students thinking about uh, US history and also about civics, their, their civic rights, we are from the Constitutional Rights Foundation, and of course their civic responsibilities as well. Uh, in addition to the kinds of knowledge, skills, and dispositions of effective civic learning that we'll talk to you about with regard to CAP. The second resource you see down here on the page is the Content Literacy and Inquiry, Inquiry and Citizenship or CLIC project. This is a California-based project that uh, was developed uh, over the last few years and CRF was involved in this. And we do have a page on, on classroom resources for effective civic learning. And we'll put that in the chat area for you as well. So you can bookmark that. There are lots of resources, including Civic Action Project that you'll see on that page. And all of these are based on the inquiry approach, which is a research-based approach to learning civics. So students actually develop questions and then to answer those questions, or maybe even better to say, to explore those questions, then the students would uh, use a number of different civic resources. And we've included them here at all grade spans, elementary, middle, and high school as well. So that's a great resource for you and it's another place for CAP. And then the third one on the page here is the C3 framework, which many of you may have heard about over the last several years, uh, CRF was involved also in the development of the C3, it's a model framework for states to use, uh, focusing on college, career, and civic life. We heard for many years and still do on occasion, uh, a lot of talk about college and career. Those are important, they're very important, but uh, we as long as, as along with many of our partners in the civics field want to make sure that civic life is also included in there. So students are lifelong civic participants, which is an important part of what the state seal of civic engagement is designed to do. And the C3 framework is based on inquiry. In fact, it's structured as an inquiry arc. And you see the four parts to the inquiry arc here, the four dimensions uh, to the inquiry arc, uh, where students develop questions, they apply their disciplinary tools and concepts, they learn to evaluate sources and use evidence, really important. That was a big part of the Common Core State Standards. It's still a big part of everything that uh, we're doing in civics uh, today. And finally, students communicate the conclusions and take informed action, which really is the core of what the Civic Action Project is about and the Civic Engagement Projects that are part of the California State Seal of Civic Engagement, which is what I'm going to talk to you about now. So all of those resources are uh, resources that can help students uh, earn the State Seal of Civic Engagement. Here at CRF, we also develop our own page to help school districts, schools, and teachers look for resources and find resources that CRF can make available in order to help students earn that state seal of civic engagement this year. Uh, and so what we did was we took the five criteria that were developed by the, the California Department of Education. And we, in, in part of the state seal is that uh, the plan is that local school districts would uh, develop their own local criteria. So we took the state criteria and we connected them to CRF resources that could help you, help students then earn the state seal. So if you look at the first two criteria, we gave them these titles here. 
So the first one we call engagement. So students need to be engaged in academic work in a productive way. The second one is understanding, and there's several components to the understanding that students need, you know, the United States and California constitutions, democratic principles, et cetera. And we have resources that we compiled from CRS many years of curriculum development, starting with high school. So by subject area, we have current issues, including we have here January 7th, 2021, because it's about how the media treated the attack on the Capitol on January 6th, uh, police reform after the death of George Floyd, and then uh, journalism under siege. Those are some current issues. But we also have US government and law related education, which crosses over a lot with current issues as well. So we have it, lessons on voter suppression, for example, what's the proper role of the judiciary? Um, and then we have world history. We don't exclude or, or neglect world history in students understanding uh, civic content. And that's also part of the California state seal criteria. So we have lessons here in world history, and of course, US history as well. We also have middle school lessons and elementary school lessons, even though those aren't directly going to help students earn the civic seal this year. Uh, we think it's important for elementary school and middle school teachers to start building that kind of civic engagement early on so that students actually can include that in their ultimate portfolio that they would develop in order to earn the civic seal on their high school diploma. So that's, uh, those are, oops, those are the, the resources we have for, there we go, for criteria one and two. Here's what we're gonna spend our time on for the remainder of this webinar, which uh, has to do with criteria three, four, and five. And these are the, the criteria that relate directly to civic engagement projects. And a civic engagement project for students dovetails very neatly with the civic action project that CRF has developed and has been working with for uh, many years now. Uh, there are links here to different parts of the Civic Action Project website, but I'm gonna leave that for a little bit later in this webinar when Gregorio is gonna show you all the components to the Civic Action Project and how students can develop their projects and then connect those to the State Seal of Civic Engagement. But this web will include a link to this page for CRFs we resources also in the chat area for you. Thanks, Damon. And then also don't don't worry about all these links. I think they're great and you guys can take a look at them. Um, I'll follow up with everyone who registered for this webinar with one document that includes everything in one document. So it'll be like kind of a go-to to resource rather than having them all the place. But I think they're really good for you if you want to take a look at them now really quickly to see what we're referring to. But just quick before we jump into CAP, I just we can't have a session without talking about the six proven practices for effective civic education based on the Guardian Democracy Report and the Civic Commission of Schools. Um, as you can tell, the criteria that Damon just went over for the state seal really is grounded in these six proven practices, right? And then Civic Action Project really is grounded in at least three of these. And one of them is providing instruction in government, history, law, and democracy. Gregory will show you um, how those lessons have a direct connection to that. Also, number two, proven practice, which is incorporating uh, discussion on current local national issues. And the key part of that one is uh, particularly those issues that young people feel is important. And that's another thing that CAP is really grounded in. Um, we believe that uh, effective civic action project is really one where young people have a stake in it, something that they are passionate about, something they believe in rather than just, just an assignment for school or that their teacher is really you know, admin about the environment or what have you. No, it's the young people who are deciding and determining, not their parents, not their teacher. It's them deciding what issues that they care about. Um, and then three, designing and implementing programs that provide students with opportunities to apply what they learn, right? So kids are getting all this information and it's out really not sure what to do with it. So CAP provides them with the opportunity to uh, actually learn civics by actually doing civics. So um, those are kind of the three main portions of the six proven practices that we'll um, talk about in CAP, and you'll see where the different proven practices are linked in, in the particular lesson plans. 
All right, so just a bird's eye view of Civic Action Project for everyone. As I mentioned, there's lessons. First of all, it's a free, CAP is free. It um, was originally created as a practicum for a government class. So again, getting students to take what they've learned and actually do something with it. Um, but since uh, we developed it, it's really expanded nationally to all sorts of classes because it's quality project-based learning, right? So we've, we've seen it in English language arts classes. We've seen it in social justice classes. We've seen it in psychology classes, Latin American studies, science classes. So really anywhere where a teacher wants to have quality project-based learning, um, they can use the, the resources that CAP provides to, to do that. So there's a lesson piece. The second step is the issue, which I mentioned earlier, right? Students select, they get these lessons, then they select an issue that's important to them, um, and then they connect that issue to policy, because that's really where sustaining change happens, when there's connection to policy. So a little different than service learning, where it might be like a park cleanup, um, you know, one week, and then the park gets dirty next week. So we really want that policy piece, and that's super important. Third, there's planners and civic toolkits. Gregorio is going to go over those, but really, we don't want the teacher to be hand-holding the students along the way. This is really a student-driven process. We have a set of planners that the students go through, and that we view the teachers more as a guide through the civic experience, right, with the students doing majority of the work, and the planners is really a nice, neat little way to get the students to work through their civic action project and document all of their steps along the way. There's also a handy-dandy toolkit, we call it a civic toolkit, really, which is a variety of civic actions that um, citizens in this community uh, undertake. So everything from how to create a petition, how do I interview a policymaker, um, how do I create a survey or a flyer? You'll see in the Civic Toolkit that there's really nice, um, neat one-page uh, PDFs on how to do those things and how to do civic action. And then finally, um, Civic Action Project is really uh, ends with a civic presentation. That civic presentation piece is super important, right? We want we want students' work to go beyond hopefully just the classroom, right? And hopefully they can present that in a meaningful way, either to the school community, the parent community, or even through to policymakers. So that's kind of a bird's eye view of the Civic Action Project and the different um, elements involved. So next, I'm going to show you what is a civic action project right you saw the bird's eye view we're going to go over um, a real authentic student project that the student worked on and i want you to look for three things in this project um, i want you to look for one what's the issue that this young person is passionate about that they chose to work on two what were the civic actions that you saw them doing and by that i mean what what are the what are things that you see this student doing you can tell from this picture that it looks like they're probably testifying somewhere but what else are they doing and then third um really what's the policy connection what you know, how was government involved in this particular um, young person's project so with that being said those three things what was the issue what's the civic actions what's the policy connection Hello, my name is Sochi Tenorio. My group members include Marina, Karen, and Joseph. Our topic is racing and speeding in Anaheim. We believe this is a huge problem in Anaheim because it causes many deaths and injuries every single day. So we began with our project with a survey to all the students and teachers as well. And we got a lot of feedback from that. And next up is a video of personal opinion from one of our staff. After Asking several people of their opinion on the survey and in person, we have decided that we should go into higher authority. So we decided to step it up and go to the Anaheim Police Department and get more information on what they have been doing and what could be in the progress of stopping this problem. So here is a clip of that interview. We see like car accidents and like racing reports and stuff like that. Every day, every day simply, um, after hours.
after having an interview with the police department, it actually helped us a lot on why, how, where, when. So we decided to look up more questions and we got these states, like these facts from NBC Los Angeles, ABC7, and OC Register. And we also went on to OTS.ca.gov, which gave us a lot of facts about our city, that there were more than 3,000 injuries and deaths in just Anaheim alone. And about 900 of those were caused by speeding. So obviously we can tell that this is a huge problem and it causes many deaths and injuries. On curbbed.com, Pulse Protects, it also stated a lot of um, ways to prevent and ways to help whenever you see this. Our action plan began with handing out flyers to our students and teachers to be aware of this problem. Here is a picture of us taking action and giving out those flyers. We then knew that handing out the flyers wasn't going to be enough, so we stepped it up even more from the interview and we decided to go speak at the city council meeting on Tuesday, April 10th at 5.30 p.m. because we believe that this should be taken not to our school only, but to the city council as well. Good afternoon. My name is Sochi Tenorio, I am Tenorio and I am a senior at Laura High School. Today I would like to bring the attention to speeding here in the Anaheim City. This topic is a big problem that we need that we have as a city and we need to put to it, an end to it. Last year we had a total of 3,268 victims killed and injured. 932 of those were caused by speeding. I live on West Ball Road and I am constantly seeing several car accidents due to racing and speeding. So everyone please help each other and help in general with, in whichever way you possibly can and I hope we can find a solution to put this in, put this to an end together as a community. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you. I uh, thank you for bringing that to our attention. I'm so sorry for your loss, and uh, and thank you for trying to prevent future loss. We have our our um, acting chief Julian Harvey standing in the back. I'm going to ask that he uh, speak with you in the lobby afterwards, and maybe specific uh, maybe specific areas or concerns or ideas that you have. Uh, please uh, let uh, Chief Harvey know. Thank you so much. Mr. Mayor, if I may, Sochil also, Sochil, also item number six this evening is actually a report from staff on a proposed uh, neighborhood traffic safety program around our schools and our parks, specifically speaking to what you're talking about. So definitely stick around for that item if you can. After speaking to the city council members to represent me, my group, and Loera in general, we decided to actually speak with the police officer that they had told me to. And he told me that, they act, that this actually helped a lot and I brought this to the city's attention and our group did very well for bringing the subject up and he, we actually helped him by giving him like places where, when, around what time it happened. And lastly, our final action is to bring it more into play and present it at the Youth and Government Day because they give you an opportunity to speak about the problem that you believe is the worst here in Anaheim. So we will be updating that with Mr. Walker as soon as we possibly can. Thank you for your attention. All right, and thank you. And they ended up actually, I think, with all their sources. They did cite their sources at the end. But let's go ahead and just debrief that really quickly. What were some of the, what was the first of all the issue that this, this these students were working on? And feel free to put it in the chat. Speeding and racing. All right, thanks, Scott. Speeding, yeah. Pete, speeding, curbing racing, right? Trying to decrease illegal street racing. Great. What about civic actions? What were some of the things that you saw these young people do? Uh, stakeholder feedback via surveys and um, interviews. Yep, they interviewed quite a few people. They did surveys. What else did they do? Ah, yep, they actually got on the agenda and they were able to speak at a city council meeting. They made a presentation. Absolutely. Right? They, I think they also did it. They met with the chief of police. 
they think they did a survey, they did interviews, they did research, they did this PowerPoint, this video. And then what about the policy connection? What was the policy connection? You have to maybe tease that out a little bit. What were they trying to do? To curb the speeding and racing that resulted in death and accidents. Absolutely. So it looks like they were trying to enforce a policy that probably was already in existence of uh, curbing illegal street racing, right? So they're trying to bring that awareness to the fact that maybe, you know, there needs to be more done. Excellent. Good job. And actually, I just would like to ask you guys just really quickly too, why do you think that understanding a policy is so important for developing youth voice? Why do you think that's important to understand policy? Because sometimes I think that word is scary sometimes, especially to young people, but why is that an important aspect of, of developing youth voice? Can you hear me? Yes. I can, Scott, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say, it, it, it kind of, it makes it clear like where in the government the, the person would need to go to to take informed action on the issue. If they can't connect it to the policy, then they don't really know uh, where to go to do something about it. Exactly. Uh, that, that, that's youth voice with traction. <laughs> it's not just students raising awareness. It's really them engaging the decision makers in their community and trying to influence um, their decisions. That's youth voice with, with, with teeth. It really means, it makes it meaningful. And these are elected officials who, I, I constantly remind students, you need to remind elected officials who don't respond to you that you'll be a voter in a year or two. And they okay. need to start becoming familiar that they can, they do have ways to actually influence some of the decisions that they're subject to, that they don't have to be only subject to policy, that they can actually influence. Okay. And, and I just like to add too, like, I think, Projects like these are super rewarding, not just for the students, but for the teachers, right? Because you don't have to wait to see if they're getting what you're what you're teaching them. That you're not waiting. Well, I hope they vote when they're old enough to vote. No, they're actually taking action now. We don't have to wait and and see. So I appreciate that. And then also just a quick shout out to Kyle from Aware because that's one of his students, and it's a teacher who's um, on this professional development today. So. Uh, appreciate what great work you are doing uh with the young people you are teaching oh, you mean, um dance the whole day and kyle if there's something okay. else you'd like to add feel free to add um i know kyle the, um, does a lot of different stuff over at loera but that was a great example it has all of the essential elements of, of a cap project it makes it very concrete for students because this is what they need to do identify an issue um, exercise or, or complete some civic actions and find a policy connection. That is essentially what a CAP project looks like. All right, so we're gonna turn it over to Gregorio to kind of walk you through the website to show you where these free resources are. Here we go. So I think everyone should be able to see the CAP website. So if you look, this is where we've concentrated all of the different resources and activities that students can complete to develop their own CAP project, very similar to the example you just saw right now. On the top right-hand corner, you'll see that login button. This is where you'll go to register to get your own username and password. I already have one, so I just gonna log in. And if you're a high school teacher and you log in, this will be your personal dashboard. And this is where all of the resources that you'll need to, uh, to not only um, deliver the lessons, but for the students. The website was really designed as a platform for students to access resources to complete their project one civic action at a time. What's really important to also point out, we don't expect students to solve homelessness in a semester, but we do expect them to emerge from this experience as experts as to the impact of homelessness in their community, because at that point, they are now self-qualified to really influence the decisions of the decision makers. As I constantly remind the students, they are the experts of what it's like to live in their community. That's what they bring to the table. So you see, we have different versions of CAP. Um, we have one for the AP um, that um, satisfied the College Board's Applied Civics Project requirement. 
We have a cap online that was developed during the lockdown. So this is a distance learning sequence of lessons, distance remote version. Um, we also have CAP for STEM. This is something that we developed with UCLA and LA Water Keepers and it allows students to use science, chemistry, and biology to address environmental issues in their community. But for today, we're going to stick with original CAP, the original flavor, which consists of 15 lessons, only five of which are necessary to get the students started on developing their project. So let's take a look at that first lesson, a different kind of government course each lesson has the same basic format. It has an overview describing what the content is going to be covered. We've aligned it with the, the government 12th grade government standards of these listed states, the common core standards that this lesson addresses, and also the proven practices that are embedded in each CAP lesson. Um, we have a list of objectives, what the students will accomplish um, during the lesson, a materials list of everything you'll need to deliver the lesson, and then step-by-step -step, um, um, instructions for delivering the lesson with your students. On the left-hand column, we have a short video of the lesson being delivered in a CAP classroom by a CAP teacher. And if the particular topic being focused on in this lesson, if it's something you'd like to, your students to take your deeper dive on, we have additional readings right here that you can assign to students if you want to take a deeper dive on those lessons. Each lesson is designed to be done in 40 to 45 minutes. We're very sensitive to the fact that teachers don't have a lot of instructional time um, to always devote to civic engagement. So we've been um, very careful to make these lessons very deliverable and um, easy for the students to um, um, grasp and then move forward as they develop their CAP project. So that's the first lesson. What the students do here is they complete a citizenship brainstorm activity where they create their own profile of citizenship. And what's really important about that, the result, um, they do it using the four categories of knowledge, skills, attitudes, and actions. And the resulting profile is a direct reflection of their values, their priorities, what they think is important to get things done in their community. So that's the first activity. It sets the context and it really helps them develop a definition of citizenship where they see themselves in that description. The next lesson is an introduction of public policy, same format, overview, standards, objectives, materials list. All of the handouts are accessible and links in the lesson, embedded in the lesson. All of the handouts, all of the materials are accessible in the lesson, online lessons. In this particular lesson, students look for examples. They do an online news media search. It could also be print media if not all students have um, internet access. They do an online media search to look for examples of problems and issues being addressed through policy. It could also it could be public policy, but it could also be private policy. Businesses have policies as well. So it could be their issue could actually be with a policy that a private business may be actually implementing or adopting. <clears throat> Once again, on the left-hand column, supplemental resources for the students to get, a, once again, a deeper understanding of the topic. The third lesson is a really critical lesson. This is where the students do a simulation activity that enables them to take a very broad issue like homelessness and narrow it down to a very specific cause or effect. For instance, they were going to address the issue of homelessness in their community by focusing on the lack of mental health services. Now the students have something concrete and accessible. These are the types of decisions that they can influence in their local civic bodies, either the city council, um, city hall, whoever it is that's responsible for um, crafting or drafting and enforcing local policy. So once again, step-by-step -step instructions, all of the handouts, once again, accessible from in the lesson and better in the lesson of video. And we also have a video here, um, we call it the Mikey video, which illustrates once again, the connection between problems, issues, and policy. The next lesson is introducing policy analysis. And what we've done, we've gotten different, um, let's see, different examples, news stories from around the country of issues and problems being addressed through, through policy. So the students will read one of these case studies, and they will then do a policy case study analysis. We call it the grade um, policy analysis tool whether you look at what was the um, goal of the policy, its rivals and supporters, advantages, disadvantages, and whether the policy is effective, why or why not. And finally, the last lesson illustrates how the three branches of government can interact to not only draft and adopt the policy, enforce a policy, and ultimately have to rescind that same policy because of some constitutional issues that came up. 
In the original version, it's essentially a case study on the Chicago Gang Congregation Ordinance, and they once again do a great analysis of the, of the, of the um, policy, and they see why it was drafted, how it was enforced, and what the problem with enforcement was that ultimately resulted in it having to be rescinded um, due to constitutional issues. It was eventually revised and then actually once again reapplied, but I think it's been going back and forth, that particular um, policy or issue. Once again, supplemental resources on the left-hand column. We also have a civil conversation version, which allows it's a structured methodology that allows students to discuss controversial issues. So we also have a, a, a civil conversation version that you can use to look at the same particular topic or issue. I'm gonna go back to the dashboard. Whenever you're lost, you go back to the dashboard. Now, if you're a middle school teacher, now I wanna point out, I have administrative access. So I, can, I have access to both dashboards at the same time. If you register the high school teacher, this will be your dashboard. If you register as a middle school teacher, this will be your dashboard. We also have two versions. We have a cap elective version, 21 lessons, but this is being used on an after school club model with the Boys and Girls Club in Florida rather successfully. They've done a lot of great projects. We have a great partner over there, the Florida Joint Center for Citizenship with the Lou Fry Institute. But I think for the purposes of this webinar, we're going to focus on CAP for Government, which is a much more doable sequence of 10 lessons. Once again, five middle school core lessons, which are essentially the middle school versions of the lessons we just looked at. Same format, overview, standards, objective, materials list, Everything you need is already embedded in the lesson. This is an example of how the citizenship profile looks when the middle school students do it. They put all of the knowledge items in the head. They put the action items, I think, in the arm, um, the attitudes right here in the torso, and maybe actually maybe the actions in the leg and the skills in the arm. So that's how they created their, pro their, uh, their profile of citizenship, which we recommend that the teachers keep because students can continue adding to that as they continue to develop their CAP project. The real purpose, the real benefit of that is once again, that the students see themselves in this concept of citizenship, that it's not just an academic or um, legal term, but it's really a term and a role that they're expected to fulfill on behalf of democratic, our democratic society. So let's go back. So that is the middle school dashboard. I also wanna point out very quickly, we have planners and these planners allow the students to document every step of their project. And this one, they're going to let the teacher know what is the issue that they plan to address or investigate and why they think it's important. I always remind students that unless they write it down, it's almost as if they never happen. So this is a way for them to record their civic experience as it's developing. And it's also a way for you, the teacher, to monitor their progress and make sure to lead them in the right direction, coach them in the right direction. After you develop the lessons, we expect the students to develop the project on their own. Once you take away the burden of having to actually solve the problem or issue, it's really a lot easier for them to feel that they can just experiment with different civic actions, that that's where you want them to go. The ideal outcome, once again, is that they emerge from this experience really being the experts on the impact of their selected issue on their community, or why did they choose it for in the first place? Why is it important? And why is it important to everyone else that it be investigated and addressed? That's a proposal. We have a thinking it through, maybe after their initial research, they wanna shift gears and this is where they would document that change in the process. They would document it here. Once again, fill it out, give it back to you and then you just give them the green light to continue on with what they're doing. We then have a civic action planner. This is where they document every discrete civic action that they're doing. I think it's, it's helpful if they do at least complete three or four of these. Um, so they at least get three or four civic actions under their belt that they've actually applied to their project. And once again, with the goal of gaining a real deeper understanding of why the issue is important and who's involved with the related policy. We really want them to find out who's making the decisions in their community. I go into classrooms a lot of times in Los Angeles and I'll ask students, do you guys know who your council member is? They rarely, if ever, do. And I remind them that's the person who's paid to live in your neighborhood. Then all of a sudden they perk up and start pinging out their devices and looking to see who this character is, who's getting paid to actually live in my community. And they get a budget to hire a staff whose sole purpose is to respond to your concerns and feedback. That really gets them to start thinking, at the very least, I'm going to find out who this person is. Once again, they're beginning, gaining a deeper understanding of how democracy works in their community. And finally, 
the report planner. This is essentially a reflection piece. If nothing else, if you have the students complete the proposal and the report, if nothing else, that would be very important. It's a document. And what's really important is that since they're not going to solve climate change in one semester, they at least documented the step in the right direction that they've completed. And the next group of students who wants to do climate change, instead of starting from scratch, they can then read what the previous group of students did and then pick up where they left off. And as I tell students, who knows, in maybe 5, 10, 15 years, exactly what you wanted to happen actually happened. You can remember that you were the one who got the ball rolling. As Laura mentioned, we have a toolkit under the student action tab. If you go to the toolkit, these are examples of the discrete civic actions we were talking about. So what I let teachers know is when a student asks, what should I do next? You simply refer to them to the toolkit and say, take your pick. Look at one of these discrete civic actions and then decide which one you're going to apply. There are almost 99% of them are one pagers. This has several pages because it has a lot of graphics, but it was really adapted from a single page document. But this is one on how they can complete or create their own opinion folder survey. Really helpful because I think the first step students need to do is does everyone else in their community feel the same way about this issue? Gather the data. Maybe it's not the maybe it's not just the average resident whose feedback they want. Maybe they want to hear what business owners have to say about a particular issue. Maybe it's local law enforcement, whatever it is, simply become informed and really in the process become players in that process of trying to address and gain a deeper understanding and influence on action on that particular issue. I also want to point out on that student action tab, we have student action. This is where you'll find examples of different student projects that have already been completed and we've divided them by theme. We have high school, we have high school examples and we also have middle school examples of projects that have always been completed. I always recommend for teachers when you introduce CAP, the first thing you should do is show your, pick a project that you'd like your students to do and do the same debrief exercise we did for all of you. What was the issue? What were the civic actions? And um, what was a policy connection? They now know once again, these are the concrete expectations of them as they develop their own CAP project. Um, we have a connect tab. This is where we occasionally will host. We have a CAP youth board and this is where we will occasionally host. It's also a great list of all the different issues that students have, have um, tried to address in the past. And what we'll sometimes do is we'll bring the um, CAP youth board together and they'll host the day or an afternoon of office hours where they can interact with other students who are currently developing their CAP project. These students, the CAP Youth Board is made of students that have already um, have been CAP, they're CAP alumni essentially, and they've already completed a CAP project. So they're now essentially being graduated to peer consultants and they've continued to remain civically engaged. I think I've covered everything, right, Laura? I think so. Anything else? I think I did. No, I think Damon just, before we move on to Patty, our teacher, I think um, Damon just posted a question for folks. If, if you can think of what issues that your students care a lot about, yeah. we're just curious if you know what they, what, what they care about. And we're just curious. We're just collecting some info feedback from all of you teachers. And this is nothing we're necessarily going to debrief in this, in, in this particular webinar. But if you can please provide some responses because it really guides us as we continue to develop and this program continues to evolve. It's like democracy itself. It's a very fluid situation. And every semester we end up having to do updates on particular lessons, pull resources off, put new resources in. So if you could provide us with some feedback to those questions, that would be really great and helpful. I think on that note, I think we might be ready for Patty. Patty, you there? She's here. All right. Yes, Patty, I am. <laughs> so Patty's a veteran CAP teacher from Bell Gardens High School. She's been teaching CAP, I would think, like eight, nine, ten years, perhaps. She's been with us almost from the very beginning. And um, if we go to the Getting Started with CAP box, which you'll find on your dashboard, you'll see the three easy steps to get started with CAP, getting your password, getting your student to use their name and password, and teaching the lessons. But what Patty's also done, Patty developed this little handout. And what she's going to do, she's going to share how she introduces CAP and implements CAP with her students. So welcome, Patty. Hello, everyone. So yeah, like Diego said, uh, I've been, I think I looked up today just out of curiosity how long I've been working with CRF. And I think the first email that I have for passwords for the CRF website was in 2010, 2009. Wow. So, so there's it from the beginning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was a trip <laughs> to say the least. Um, but yeah, um, I've loved the program since the beginning. 
and it's been uh, getting better and better almost year after year after year. And it's almost like um, when they finally release the information for the seal of civic engagement for the state of California, it almost felt like, oh, okay, they're, they're jumping on board with the CRF civic action project. Like it almost felt like a natural progression. Um, nothing, um, how should I say this? Not, there's nothing that they're gonna ask us that's so new that it'll be strange to a lot of the people that have been doing CAP for years now. Um, so just real quick, um, a couple of suggestions that I've had over the years, or I've tried it several different ways to kind of embed it into the uh, into my curriculum. Um, and what I have found is that there's no one size fits all with the curriculum that CRF uh, has put together. Um, you have to do what's right, not only for your class, but for your personality, your teaching style, uh, the community that you're in. Um, and I've tried uh, the three options that are on this, uh, what's the fit uh, handout. I've tried all three. Um, this year, I'm actually correlating it to my existing pacing. So uh, I'm just finishing lesson four, I believe. Lesson four about to start lesson five next week. And the biggest thing that I have found is depending on the situation and what has what is going on in your school, one option or the other might work best for you. Uh, this year, uh, we're piloting a new textbook and I wanted to try to embed it um, within the pacing plan that we currently have. Now, with that being said, I always make sure that at the beginning of the school year, I put it in the course syllabus or at the beginning of the semester. We are a one semester American government course at uh, Bell Gardens High School. And um, I've noticed that if I embed it right from the beginning on the syllabus, it's not a shocker, shocker to my students. They know that there's a project coming. They know we're building up to it. And they know that during finals week, that that's what we're gonna be working on. Presentation of their uh, civic action projects, as well as I, I also do it as a reflective piece as to what they've learned in that kind of like a capstone at the end of the semester. Um, just out of curiosity, um, how many has there? Is there anybody here that has taught Sierra? No, sorry, CAP in the past. Yeah, um, and out of curiosity, uh, how many of you have tried at least one of these options that are on the on the what's the fit uh, as an introduction unit, as a second marking period? That's how, the way to start the second quarter, or uh, just embedding the lessons within your pacing plan. Number two, yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, like I, I, I personally have, like I said, the, the one that it correlates exactly with our pacing plan. Uh, sometimes it's easier to explain it to administrators why you're working on certain things at certain times and kind of like an ease of mind as to why uh, it's kind of like a embedded PBL. If those of you that are engaging in PBL, especially this might be something that just beautifully marries in with your pacing plan. Uh, what I've also noticed is that because all of the lessons are uh, aligned to the standards, not only our California subject matter standards uh, and our common core standards, they also abide by the framework and in the inquiry arc. Um, what I have found is that it makes our PLC time, our collaboration time with our colleagues a lot easier to go ahead and collaborate on lessons together. Even when it's from different subject areas, because the skills are there or they could tie in a historical aspect into one of the lessons that's being conducted through CRF. And it makes it nicer when we, when I have them senior year, if they kind of saw something similar, their freshman, sophomore, junior year, even if it's in a historical perspective with those, um, kind of analyzing the, the policies in the past. So that's always a nice thing. Um, the CAP toolkit, uh, again, PBL based, and I like this just because, like I said in the past, it marries so well into the civic engagement, the, the seal of civic engagement. Um, the fact that our seniors are gonna have some kind of evidence that they've engaged civically at their local level. Um, as far as CRF, um, I think I've worked for, like I said, with CRF for a very long time. There hasn't been one time that I've gotten stuck or had no clue how to really um, get my students unstuck from a certain uh, lesson that I haven't called somebody at CRF or emailed somebody at CRF. And within the day, they get back to me saying, 
hey, what's, what's going on? How can I help? That's always with no judgment involved. I, I cannot tell you how, how nice that feels uh, to have someone there to help you through lessons at times, especially as uh, if some of you are new teachers, um, the non-judgment that you could call somebody to let you know what, where you could go with, with the facilitating of the lesson. Um, furthermore, I think what's also helpful is the fact that they're always willing to say, you're always willing to say, you know what, I tried this and it worked. For them to share that knowledge with the rest of us, that's also very helpful uh, to have that learning community uh, in, within CRF. They're not a fly by night kind of, we have this to give to you and then they disappear. And then next year in the fall, they appear again. It's nothing like that. They're, they're there all year long to help you out with whatever they can. So I wanna thank CRF for that. And then of course, any, any questions? You know, Patty, we had a question from one um, teacher was asking how long it takes. I know the answer depends, but what, how does it work for you? Um, yes, um, so uh, depending. So when I do the introductory lesson, um, as, I, sorry, if I do it as an introductory unit, it takes me about a week, week and a half to get through the unit itself. If I do, like I said, the correlate, uh, correlating it with a pacing, uh, with my pacing plan, It'll take maybe a class period for that specific lesson. Um, and because you've already talked about it in your pacing plan, you have to do a lot less background. Uh, that's one thing that I've noticed that when I do it as an introductory unit, that I have to give more background to students uh, to get them to what, what poly like talk about the vocabulary and the terms more so than when I'm already embedding it within the, the pacing plan. And when it's part of the second, mark, second marking period, again, sometimes I do come across that situation where uh, I might have to, depending on what issues they, they select, I might have to kind of front load uh, more vocab for certain groups, depending on the situation. Um, but if I just do it with a pacing plan, I, I feel more comfortable with, you cut out some of that time, but you also give them less time to do some of their actions that they need. That's a drawback with option two. The fact that if you embed the lessons within the pacing plan, you might not give them as much time as they need to really feel like they have three, four, five ch chances to engage in civic actions in their community. So like it, they all come with pros and cons. Great, are there any other questions for Patty? Thanks a lot, Patty. I mean, as always, your, your experience. I mean, I learned, you know, after every time I hear it, I learned a little something else on something else you might want to consider to update. And just really quickly, because I know all of us work in different communities. I, I've, I, I've taught AP, uh, EL learners, new arrivals, SDC, uh, special populations. Uh, trust me, it, the, way, the reason I love it so much is that it, it scaffolds itself almost with the groups and who they're working with and how they are answering and how you could help them. That um, usually the kids that you don't really expect them to really embrace the projects are the ones that surprise you the most. Um, so that's, my, that's been my experience. I've had kids win uh, things with CRF that were part of my special population, uh, SDC kids. And I've had my new arrivals come up with extraordinary projects that I would have never kind of seeing things through that lens. So it's also insightful, not, not only for students, but also as you as a teacher, as how you could further support students that are coming up later on. So, yeah. Are there any other questions for Patty? And as Patty mentioned, we're always available to support you guys. In fact, we're especially now that we've all pretty much mastered the distance learning, we'd be more than happy to to remotely um, 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 introduce CAP to your students at the classroom. If you just let us know, give us a heads up. We'd be more than happy to do that introductory session just to get your students on board. So I just uh, I just went uh, and signed up the thing for CAP, and it says it will like let me know in thirty six hours or whatnot. So is that how it works or? Yes, you'll get, you should get a username or password within 24 hours. That's interesting, 36 is pretty arbitrary. I'm gonna check on that, but it should be 24 hours. But yeah, 24 it, to 36. Yeah, it's just to verify that you are 
on our end, we just verify that you really are, you know, who you say you are, you're not a bot right. because we do have, you know, students who come on and join the discussion board. We just want to make sure the environment's a safe environment. So Absolutely. you look at it and check your junk mail because sometimes we go to junk. Yeah. <laughs> it's not yeah junk. I mean, I go to your guys' website, you know, I'm registered there, but then, um, so even though it's in like we're already in the second progress reporting period, it's still okay to go ahead and, and jump in then. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, all right. Yeah. Cause I'm yeah. sorry, some some of them, uh, some of the lessons, I think it's three and four, sometimes depending, uh, you could assign three as part of homework of four, just because uh, when you are kind of, um, talking about policy with your students, it'll be a, a nice leak over to them thinking about their own policies in their own communities. So some, and then you could just debrief the following day when they come back in. So it's almost like, yeah, it, 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 so you could cut some time on some of them, but for the most part, it is just, uh, yeah, it, it, it's fine. The second quarter marking period, it, it works a little bit rushed, but you'll have enough time. Okay, all right. Thank you very much. So Laura, who's sharing now? I think we're going to the next slide. Well, I think it's just now kind of our next steps. Um, okay. Yeah, so again, we'll stay on to answer any questions you have. We have a couple of next steps for you. Obviously register as um, Audra, I think it is who did. Uh, if you registered on the CAP website, you'll get a username and password. We're happy to have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with you and kind of walk you through things. I know we shared a lot of information and sometimes you might not know where to find things. Um, if you have students that you want to actually participate in the resources, you can upload a roster and we'll send that information to you to give them access to the website as well. Um, and then, like I said, reach out for support. We're, we're, there, to, we're there to help, um, you know, whether it's just a meeting with you, with meeting with your your team, meeting with your school, your district, what have you, we're we're happy to show you what this looks like in the classroom. And then I post a survey. Please go ahead and uh, uh, click on that survey. Let us know if you thought this today's uh, PD was informative. And then we'll, we'll do a raffle. So we'll do a little Starbucks because who can't use more Starbucks uh, <laughs> prize uh, for one of the participants who submit the survey. So please do that. It's really helpful information for us moving forward and really want to help. We want to see more students, especially students maybe from underserved schools to get this civics, this diploma, the seal of civic engagement on their diploma. I think it's it's important for them to do so, and it looks really good on their college applications. And um, you know, we we want to play a role in that, and support you in um, any way that we can. So, Melissa, I believe has a question. Yeah, sorry. Um, it says to submit a class roster. I'm actually a TOSA in my district, so I'm providing support for the different high schools. So, yeah. what would I still be able to access everything? Yeah, absolutely. You don't have to submit the school roster. You you just sign on, you register, and you'll get access to everything. Really, the school rosters, you want the students to participate in, um, you know, the discussion boards and things like that. But you, as a CAP teacher, you can still do CAP without necessarily submitting the roster. It's very flexible, whatever, you know, however Thank much you. you'd like to participate. Awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. If the if the goal is to um to get the seal on your diploma, what can be my um my motivation for middle school? Damon, Damon, I go ahead. <laughs> You're muted, Damon. He's got to find the mute. Okay, oh, I'm fine. Um, so yeah, the uh. We, we have those resources for middle school, and I think for students in middle school, mm -hmm. if you look at the, the state criteria, mm -hmm. uh, criteria number five, four and five show that students uh, compile sort of uh, kind of a portfolio or, or documentation of, of the civic engagement that they've done. Mm -hmm. And they can go ahead and, and even though it, eventually when they're in high school, they'll get that that uh, civic seal or the state seal, they can include uh, long-term projects or, or things that they've done in the long-term on there as part of their complete okay. portfolio. So, um, and I think it's it's great because it shows uh, 
that the student has been civically engaged for uh, for a long time. And since they were uh, in middle school, I think that's um, that's a great way for them to show that they uh, can earn the seal. Um, yeah. Event, you know, and so for this students this year, it won't it won't make a difference, but uh, eventually it certainly will. So it's worth it for middle school students. So it's yeah, a great, think, a great will use for the planners. If the students I'll, complete I'll their planner, they would out. document everything. Absolutely, and I'll reach out to our feeder high school, Mira Mesa High School, and see if they have an active uh, CAP program. And if they do, then I'll, I'll work with that teacher and hopefully we can get a, a, a pipeline to <laughs> a pipeline of civic engagement. <laughs> That'd be great. Yeah. All right. Thanks. That's great. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you.